Yo, yo, what is up, my beautiful people, and welcome to the special episode 15 special of Zach's Artful Podcast. I'm, of course, your host, Zach Cobb. Yo, 15 episodes, that's crazy. I can't believe, even believe I already made it to 15 episodes. Like, this is absolutely crazy. Just thank you all so much for sticking with the show for this long. Thank you to all the wonderful guests from the past that have been on the show for just sharing your wonderful stories and just being amazing, talented people that you are. And thank you listeners for listening to said stories, whether you've listened or shared an episode around, you know, it's it, any, anything helps out and we just here to entertain you and share undiscovered talents around the world because The world needs a little bit more creatives every now and then, you know. All right, enough of the sappiness. Let's get into today's awesome episode. So kick back, relax, and enjoy the ride. I hope you are having a wonderful, wonderful day, wherever you're doing, whatever you're doing. No, I just hope that you're all in good spirits. So, today, we have ourselves a wonderful, wonderful guest. He's a great friend of mine, a fellow animation lover, and a fellow nerd. Please give it up for the legend himself. Ian Shelton, how are you doing? Not too bad, Zach. How about you? Oh, I'm doing all right, man. You know, I'm... So, you know, tell the people about yourself, man. You know, uh, who get a, give them a good vision of who Ian Shelton is. Well, uh, as Zach has already stated, I am one of his best friends. A really good friend of his. Um, I am a huge nerd when it comes to... Uh, Star Wars, Transformers, somewhat Nintendo. I am a, I am a whiz at music. Like I have perfect pitch. I know how to play a lot of instruments. I've performed in a lot of uh, theater productions. I'm a huge theater nerd as well. And uh, oh yeah, and I also love love buying Lego sets. I currently have over fifty thousand bricks. All right, so now Ian's going to continue adding on to his list of giant credits going on. I want to try to explore all that realm. So what made you initially interested in um, the arts, like whether it be theater or music? Honestly, it all started back when I was in fourth grade. Like uh, everybody in my fourth grade class was required to uh choose an instrument to play just for that year if we wanted to continue in that course well if we wanted to to continue playing that instrument as we started going further through uh through our school years then uh yeah we were able to do that so the instrument i chose was the trombone Mm. and again that was back in fourth grade when i started doing it and ever since then, I've just been playing the trombone for the concert band at my school. Uh, and eventually, I added some other instruments for that, to that criteria. I added uh, trumpet and cornet, along with uh, euphonium and tuba. And I eventually, uh, well, I'm not too good at it yet, but I eventually added the piano to my criteria. And, uh, yeah, I'm definitely not the best at it, but I, I wouldn't exactly consider myself to be bad, per se. Yeah. And that's only for musical arts. Uh, theater arts was a little more... It was a little weirder for me. Hmm. 
like uh, I got started with uh, participating in theater production later than I did with uh, the trombone. I auditioned for a school play back when I was in sixth grade. And uh, when the final cast was announced, I pretty much had the smallest role out of anybody in the entire cast. Like, it, it, it wasn't even a debate. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I really enjoyed the experience from that, and I chose to expand upon it further by participating in a variety of theater productions, not only for my middle and high school, but also for my college, which I'm currently attending as of right now, and uh, some productions from my local community as both a pit orchestra member and a cast member. I could go for I could go a little more in depth into it, but I feel like that would just uh, no, no. I, like, no uh, you, okay. I would love to hear all all these wonderful theater stories because you know. Well, we I. As I stated just now, I have participated in a variety of productions as both a cast and a um, pit orchestra member. Right. But that's not, that's not entirely all my experience. Like uh, a variety of the, theor of the theater productions I've been in. Um, I was also a crew member for quite a few of them. And there were even a couple of middle school productions in which I was a student director. I direct, I was in charge of uh, Swarm for the first production I was a student director for. And the second one, I was in charge of lighting. In terms of theater, in terms of theater productions, I'm sort of a jack of all trades. Although considering, although considering the kind of names that Hollywood has, like uh, Joaquin Phoenix, uh, Cary Grant, just to name a few, Ian Shelton doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily sound that cool when compared to some of those other big What are you star talking albums? about? Yeah. Ian Shelton is the name of a genius brand right there, okay? A just, it was just oomph. There's an oomph to it. Yeah. That's, and that's just probably me just trying to hype you up, but like, I genuinely think that Ian Shelton, it would be a dope. Like, star name? Uh, one time when I was in high school, I did go through, like, a little bit of a research project for uh, the names of the people behind Hollywood. Yeah. And I believe there was a whole system in place where uh, the names of the actors that we see in the end credits of movies are slightly different than their actual, uh, than their actual names. Uh, like, uh, I'm sure you know who Oscar Isaac is, right? Oh, of course. Yeah, uh, his full name is Oscar Isaac Hernandez Estrada, I believe. And uh, whenever he's referred to in the credits of movies or TV shows, he's always listed as Oscar Isaac. Hmm. So... I yeah. gotcha. So, like, you think? Do you, are you thinking of like trying to short it down, or would you? Are you thinking of going by something else? I honestly thinking of going by something else, and honestly, I have an idea for what I might want to be called by, and it's not too far off from my name. Okay. Okay. What are you thinking? I was thinking of calling myself John Andrew. Did you Ooh, actually kind of nice. Yeah, I, I do kind of like that. Yeah, I feel like it would work because Andrew is my middle name, so I wouldn't have to change anything there. And uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the name Ian is Scottish for the English name John. So technically speaking, my name for all intents and purposes is John. Ah, I didn't. I had no idea about that. Yeah. So, so yeah. If I ever make it to Hollywood, I'm thinking of going by John Andrew. Any big projects coming up for you? Well, I did tell you about this a while ago, but I am still. I haven't worked on it in a while, but I am currently in the progress of writing my own Transformers show. It's nice. And where will that be debuting on? I'm. 
Not entirely sure about that at the moment because, like, it's still in the creative process. Like, like I'm still trying to write down the full glimpse of the story or how to. Okay, basically, it's still a work in progress, and I have no idea when it would even be close to uh, to debuting. You've already talked about, you know, all the things you've done over the, uh, uh, what do you feel like personally has had the most impact on you? I feel like, I feel like auditioning for that very first theater production I did back when I was in sixth grade has had the biggest impact on me as a person. Not only did that help me to discover what I wanted to do with my life, but it was something that I knew I was good at or at least one of the things I was good at. Did you feel like you got to kind of experience a lot uh, different side of things when you were directing uh, the student play? Yeah. Well, I mean, technically, you get a whole new perspective of the int of a single theater production when you, well, not only when you're, when you're a director, but whenever you do any other side, like, Whenever I do theater productions, I'm an actor first and everything else second. Gotcha. Like, uh, like uh, I have done quite a few theater productions as a crew member, but uh, the only reason why I participated in crew for a few theater productions was because I didn't get, uh, I wasn't cast in the final, uh, well, cast in list of the final selection. Actor. Yeah, so I always participated in crew so that even if I wasn't acting, I still would have been participating in the yeah. play in some way. Yeah, like you're still like contributing in the show even though you're not like on stage. I'm also going to say that having participated in multiple fields of a theater production, like, like I said, I'm an actor, crew member, a director, and a pit orchestra member. Uh, having to having to participate in all those various areas of a theater production has helped me to gain a wider experience on what makes a theater production as phenomenal as it is. So, what do you feel like is in like your favorite role uh, in a produ uh, the a theater production? Honestly, I would probably have to go with. Uh, my senior year of high school, uh, we did this musical called The Music Man. Uh, sure yes, know. yes. And uh, not to confuse it with uh, The Music Man from Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but uh, for my senior year of high school, that was the last musical I did for my high school. And I was cast as... I wasn't cast as Harold Hill himself, but I was cast as uh, Major Shin. And uh, Major Shin, in our version of the production, served as a replacement for one of the quartet members in that production. That sounds like a good idea on paper, but when you really think about it, it's, uh, it's not exactly a good idea. Ah. The reason, yeah, I mean, like, the reason why the directors of the show decided to uh, replace one of the quartet members with uh, Mayor Shin was because there's already a lot of scenes in which the mayor is seen on stage with the quartet. Right. So having to, so having to have Mayor Shin in the quartet himself wouldn't exactly be that big of a issue to deal with. Uh, but there was a bit of a problem that though oh what's that uh harold hill who's the main character in the music man claims to be a music man himself but in reality he couldn't be farther off like he doesn't know a single thing about music yet he comes into a town called river city iowa i believe and tries to put together a boy's band in an attempt to uh, make money off of them. So basically, he's a scam artist. 
Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, the quartet that we see in The Music Man is supposed to be the uh, uh, school board of directors, I believe. And they're all trying to get Harold Hill's credentials. So in order to avoid in order to avoid uh, the board of directors catching him, Harold Hill made the made all four members of the board into a barbershop quartet. And it's kind of ironic because of uh, all the members of the board have hated each other for the last 15 years. And Harold Hill all of a sudden brought them together like they're brothers from the same mother. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's fine. We get we have this musical connection now, so it's fine. Yeah, yeah. But um, where this factors into uh, where this factors into the problem that my production had with this uh, was when one was when. One line uttered by Harold Hill says, and I quote, Ladies, from now on, you'll never see one of those men without the other three. So basically, Harold Hill was saying that whenever you see one member of the quartet, the other three won't be far behind. Mm. Yeah. And since there are multiple scenes in The Music Man where Mayor Shin is seen without the rest of the quartet, can see how that would be a problem. So, uh, you mentioned you are a big Transformers fan. You know, how did you get introduced to the franchise? Uh, well, I knew about the franchise for a while, but I never really got into it at first. Mm. However, one of my close friends who who's one of your close friends as well. Yes. Uh, he introduced me to the world of Transformers through the uh, the 1986 movie with uh, Robert Stax, I believe, and uh, Leonard Nimoy. Oh, and Orson Welles. Oh, of course. Intru- yeah, uh, he introduced me to the Transformers through that 1986 movie and... Since then, I've just been invested in the franchise. And recently, I've uh, bought a lot of new Transformers figures that I've really enjoyed so far, for the most part. Mm. What would you say personally? Oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say that um, (laughs) I've just been a really big fan of the Transformers franchise ever since and I've seen a lot more Transformers shows than than I would have seen otherwise had he not introduced me to the series. Gotcha. I was just going to ask um what do you feel like is like peak Transformers? Honestly, that's kind of a rough question for me because there's a lot of really good Transformers stuff out there. Like, uh, there are the first couple seasons of the G1 cartoon, which are um, very good. Uh, There's also Transformers Animated, which I've never seen a Transformers show take such huge risks and have it work out at the end. Also, there's Transformers Prime, which is arguably the best best Transformers show in... The entirety of the franchise. I liked. I really enjoyed Prime. I definitely will second second that opinion. Uh, not to mention, there's also the live action Bumblebee. Yes, yes, yes. So, oh, and not to mention, not to mention, there's also the War and Fall of Cybertron games, excluding Rise of the Dark Spark. We don't talk about that. Oh, no. Yeah, but uh, there's really just a lot of stuff about the Transformers franchise that's really good storytelling. Not just for the franchise itself, but there's a lot of things about it that can help it stand out on its own. Mm, like, like, do you get what I mean? Individual pieces, and not just like yeah. part of like this overarching storyline. Yeah. 
And yeah. not to mention you have such iconic characters like Optimus Prime and Megatron. Like, honestly, I can't really think of a better uh, good guy versus bad guy dynamic than there is with Optimus Prime and Megatron. Both of, both of the characters want the same thing, to restore their home planet of Cybertron. But their methods of saving the planet is what, uh, it's what divides them. Like, Megatron mm. wants to save Cybertron at any cost no matter who gets hurt. And Optimus wants to save Cybertron without harming any other life in the galaxy. It's a really interesting character dynamic that I don't think other other types of pop culture really focus on. Hmm. It's, like, inter it's, like, it's interesting you brought that up because I definitely agree that like how the Megatron and um, Optimus kind of have that the same ideals but go about it differently kind of like how they kind of like yeah like the yin to each other's yang it kind of like characters like Batman and Joker or um, kind of like they're the yin to each other's yan and like uh, Batman is the order to Joker's chaos and they kind of like how, dueling continuous battle within each other but they kind of need in a weird way they kind of need the other to kind of uh balance like yeah. balance each other out kind of an idea yeah and uh, i haven't seen it but wasn't there a scene in the uh the animated batman series with kevin conroy uh wasn't there a scene in which the joker felt remorse after hearing about batman Doc? Dying? Yes. Am I remembering the, that correctly? Yes, it was the episode the the man that killed the Batman. Um, it will he um yeah so he held like a mini funeral service for him, and he was upset that he wasn't the one that took out Batman because he doesn't really want Batman to die. He likes messing with him. He gives his life purpose and entertain fulfillment. Like he, yeah, like I said, he's that, he's the yin to his yang. So without the yin, like everything is just unbalanced and it's just, just more chaos. Now, Batman doesn't die, of course, but, you know, it was a very yeah, interesting I, I, perspective see, of his character, kind of see like his mentality on, of the relation and his thoughts about their relationship with each other. Yeah, and uh, I believe that, I believe that one er or that one aspect in particular is also uh, further analyzed in a couple of uh, in a couple of other Batman projects. Like there's the Lego Batman movie in which Batman finally says to Joker, "I hate you." In the entirety of their '87 year relationship, at that point, yeah. I think the movie came out in 20. 17? Uh, I don't remember for sure, but... Uh, 2017, I yes. Yeah, all I know is that Batman and Joker have been rivals, or enemies, rather, for over 80 years at that point, and Joker says to Batman that he... that Batman has never once said the words, I hate you, Joker. And at the end of that movie, Batman finally says that he hates the Joker. And that uh, Joker is the reason why Batman strives to be the person that he is. And uh, not only is not only is there that one uh, entire theme from the Lego Batman movie, uh, there's also that one uh, there's also that one iconic scene from the Harley Quinn series where the Scarecrow takes off Batman's uh, cowl. To reveal that Bruce Wayne is the man behind the mask, and of course the Joker gets all upset at him because. Uh, oh half yes, the fun, yes. Yeah, because half the fun of that dynamic was the mystery behind who Batman was as a person, and now Joker just realizes that quote. Now I know that Batman is just some boring rich asshole with parental issues. Where's my goddamn electric car, Bruce? Where's my goddamn electric car, Bruce? <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> I love I love Harley Quinn. It's such a good show. I've only seen that one clip of the series, but <laughs> if it's the so, clip is that funny, then the rest of the show is oh, it's, good. It's really good. I, I highly recommend... In general, I highly recommend everyone check out the Harley Quinn show. It's so good. It gets... It only gets better as the show goes on. And I need to watch the, check out the uh, Valentine's special they did. I definitely need to check that one out because I heard it was pretty good as well. But yeah, Harley Quinn's really, really good. And also you had uh, talked to uh, Bumblebee. Um, I didn't know this um, when, uh, when I watched it, but I found out that the director of the movie also did uh, Kubo and the Two Strings. Yeah, I, I heard about that. I didn't when know I that. Heard, that was really cool. Yeah, when I first saw the movie, I was really surprised by that as well. I, I guess that just goes to show how talented of a director Travis Knight is. Well, I say it, it definitely benefits of having an animator working on a movie. Um, with where the majority of the characters are animated because um, they under they're able to help tell a story through facial expressions and get across many emotions. Yeah, as opposed to a guy who only knows how to shoot cars and uh, bring out explosions. Exactly. Like Transformers are more than just spectacle. They're characters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Transformers are more than meets the eye. Ha! I see what you did. <laughs> I see what you did there. I see what you did there. That was that was good. That was good. I like that. But yeah, it just that I also wanted to kind of semi transition into uh, talking about animation. Because I know that's something that like you really enjoy, uh, so oh, absolutely, yeah. So, uh, like, yeah, I mean, like live action can do a lot of really cool stuff, but honestly, there's a lot more things that animation can do that live action can only dream of. Like, do you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. I I a thousand percent stand by that. Yeah, and it just it's really shocking to me that uh, Hollywood always tends to look down on animation. Like, like obviously they have, uh, they have all the awards handed out for all of their blockbuster movies and such. But what's one thing that all those movies have in common? Live action. They're all... Sorry. Oh, uh, no, I was just saying, yeah, just generally they're all live action. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for animated movies, they have an entirely separate criteria. Instead of mixing the animated movies with the live action movies, the animated movies are placed in their own separate categories. Like, that's just mind boggling to me. I mean, animated movies are still movies and animated TV shows are still TV shows. They're just done in different art forms. So there really should be no debate as to whether animated or live action is better in the eyes of Hollywood. Honestly, just boils down to what works best for the story that's trying to be told in your movie or series. If it works better in live action, then that's perfectly fine. If it works better in an animated form, then that's perfectly fine too. But there really shouldn't, there really shouldn't be this unfair advantage with live acting over animated acting. Or, like, okay, that was kind of a bad comparison, but you know what I mean, right? No, I get what you're saying. And that the crazy thing is that they did, they have that. Beauty and the Beast, I believe, um, don't quote me, uh, was the first animated film to be nominated for Best Picture. And it was it was up against a lot of stiff competition, but like it didn't win, but 
the the acknowledgement that animation was on the same level as like though like la okay i'm i'm going to be completely honest i don't necessarily consider animation to be a genre western is a genre sci-fi is a genre romance action horror all of those are genres animation is not a genre animation is an art form just like live action is an art form like you can make an animated web Stern or an animated sci-fi or you can even make a live action animation hybrid of horror romance and action anyone you could make you could make any kind of uh, stuff from those genres in any single art form but putting animation as a separate genre is that's honestly really insulting i absolutely agree with you that animation is is a legit form of film uh, filmmaking. It's just really sad to see that Hollywood is constantly disrespecting animation as a whole, unless it's like absolutely spectacular, like The Lion King back in 1996. Wait, was it 1996 or was it 1994? Lion King, yeah, 1994. 1994, right. So, yeah. Yeah, there's obviously films that have been nominated and even won the Oscars, like The Lion King in 1994, uh, Shrek from 2001, and as you mentioned earlier, Into the Spider-Verse in 2018. So animation can technically be... Animation can technically be... Uh, where am I going with this? Sorry. Animation in its own right can be just as good as live action movies and shows. Hollywood just needs to widen their range to accept animation as more of an art film or as an art form for film as a whole, as opposed to just having an entirely separate category that's specifically for it. Absolutely. Oh, I, I definitely agree with that yeah just it really well also with this year in particular it really makes me it really makes me unfortunate that there was uh there were some other animated movies that have done so much better than uh, other live action like uh, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, that went on to be a huge commercial success, didn't it? Yes, commercial, both commercially and critically. Yeah. So it it honestly just adds even more salt to the wound how uh, animated mo movies are still cast to the wayside or put to the wayside when it can be proven to perform better than other live action progress but didn't project. pinocchio ended up winning gold the the golden globes and the academy award uh and uh I oscar believe, i believe it did yes i yeah. know that puss in boots was nominated for it but i yeah i'm pretty sure pinocchio won oh yeah i personally feel like we're kind of like in this animation renaissance era where studios are trying new things, uh, new styles of animation, and not being afraid to like be different and like, it, yeah, be different and experiment a lot more. Like Pinocchio, Puss in Boots, Bad Guys, Spider Verse, like I, uh, Mitchell versus uh, uh, Mitchell's versus the Machines. Like animation, I kind of feel like is uh, coming to a new standstill with uh, experimentation that's that's showing general public that animation can be more than like what people generally think of okay, that everyone can enjoy and it's and it's not just for kids like animation is not just a kids media it's an everyone media oh yeah and i really hate when people say that animation is for kids it, it makes me just want to slap them right in the face yes because, because anim yeah, animation is not just for kids oh like, yes it's true that a lot 
Sorry. No, I'm sorry. I was just going to... And I'm like, oh, yes, my favorite kids movie, Fritz the Cat. Absolutely, yeah, totally like kid-friendly. Yeah, like, yeah, it is true that a lot of TV shows and movies that are animated are directed towards kids. But that doesn't mean that animation is specifically for kids. There's lots of adult animated stuff all around the world, whether it's good or bad. There's Family Guy, American Dad, South Park, Bob's Burgers. Heck, even Sausage Party is an adult animated movie. And that is a horrible movie from what I've heard. That's fine. I personally didn't care for it. I thought it was interesting the way they t- it delved into the topics about religion and th- with that angle per- I, with, for me personally I knew it was kind of it was a general low like the one joke is the move is that food curses and have sex that's that's it but I I was generally surprised about how like what l- little extra substance there was in it I thought it was very interesting uh but yeah they it just kind of like stuck in its own lane which is not a bad thing per se like you're getting exactly what you want you're uh, going into it you know getting exactly what they promoted but i felt like it could have been a lot more to it i don't know that's ironic like considering what i uh, talked about like saying it was yeah it's gonna be another lowbrow comedy thing, but I felt like like that it could be some anything could have substance to it, regardless of like how the like, execution. Yeah, yeah, I can see where you're going at with that, but yeah. All right. Well, thank you again for joining me. It was a pleasure having you on, my friend. It was a pleasure to be on your podcast, and thank you very much for having me. My pleasure, and thank you all so much for listening. If you liked this episode, make sure you hit that like button, comment below, like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you next time on Zach's Awful Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Cobb. Have a wonderful, stupendous day. And I'm Ian Shelton. See you guys around.